There's no way. Hey, it's my pleasure to welcome you here to Journey Church this morning. My name is Adrian. I'm the discipleship pastor here. And uh, it's such a privilege to bring the Word of God today. Like I said in first service, never in a million years would I thought I would see myself on a stage preaching. See, my background, the past 10 years of my life, I spent serving in the United States military, in the Navy. Any Navy guys in here? Hands down, best military branch in the United States of America. I said it. I said what I said, and I mean what I mean. But, like I said, it's such a privilege to be here preaching the word. And I, I feel like God has a timely message. I mean, amidst everything that's going on here in Journey, we feel the weight. We feel the heaviness. We feel the tiredness. And I felt like as I was praying and communing with God over the past couple of weeks, that he was just saying, hey, go encourage them. Tell them to keep pressing on. I know that they're tired. I know that they're beat up. But just tell them they have a role to fill, to refocus, to get back in the game. So that's what we're going to do today. For the past year, we've been training hard, right, in spiritual warfare. I mean, uh, was anyone here last fall to experience the shift series? Yeah. Pastor Eric kicked off the shift series last year by, by saying, hey, we're all on this battleship. We're all on this battleship. We're not riding a cruise ship here. Any, any cruise ship riders here today? Or are you guys actively engaged in warfare? Yeah. If you haven't seen that sermon, go check out our YouTube channel. You can follow all the way back from that sermon. But he, he said, hey, Christians, we're not called to sit the sidelines. We're called to be on a battleship. Each of you have a role in advancing God's kingdom, both serving inside the church and outside the church. And then the past couple of weeks, man, we, we went over heaven. We went over angels. We went over demons. Yeah. Were you guys here last Sunday? Man, there was a ton of deliverance. God is doing amazing things. So I hope that you are intentionally not just receiving the word, but putting it into action, right? So we've been going hard, y'all. And in the midst of everything else, life's pressure just turns up. You're doing your best you can just to stay in the word, follow your reading plan, doing the right thing, showing up and serving, and then... Life's unexpected things happen, right? Like, our new normal seems to be like we're filling, uh, living lives of our place are always full. Can anyone relate? You don't know how you're going to make it to the next section. You might be overextended. You might say, hey, my bandwidth, it's, it's already full. And then life comes knocking on the door. There it is. The next one. What's next? right? Can anyone relate to that? You're just taking one hit after the other. And hey, listen, when, when I was in the Navy, man, we would be training. We would be training hard. And we would get to those, so, those, those points in time where things would just go crazy and we're like, you know, this might be a little bit unsafe for a second. Let, let's take a training timeout. Let's pause for a second and refocus and actually figure out what we're doing here. And that's what I believe that we're doing here in this moment. Let's just, let's just take a pause, Let's just take a pause and reset, refocus our mind on what God is actually doing in the spiritual realm. Because like I said, I know a lot of you are tired, but I'm here to just, just encourage you. I'm here to tell you, hey, I'm tired too. I know what you're feeling. But man, if we're on this battleship together, I'm saying don't give up the ship. And I love that term, don't give up the ship. It's a Navy term, right? Here's the history on don't give up the ship. And I actually uh, coined my, my sermon, don't give up the ship. In June of 1813, it was during the War of 1812, Captain Lawrence was commanding a USS vessel, protecting the Boston Harbor, and he's just being bombarded from the British. Men are dying left and right. He is mortally wounded, but his last, his last response his last order to the crew was tell them to fire faster he's dying right tell them to fire faster fight keep going go down with the ship keep going don't give up the ship but the way my mind plays i'm like 
Yahweh is our captain in this battleship, is he not? But he's not mortally wounded, he's alive. And so I would hear, I, I, I want to give you that same encouragement, man. Hey, keep firing faster, stay in the fight. This ship won't sink. I've already won the battle. I've already won the battle. Tell them, tell them. You're on the winning side. You're on the winning side. So Adrian, you don't know me. You don't know my circumstances. You don't know who I've lost. I understand that. I understand that. But, but us as a collective body of Christ, we can feel the pressures all around us. We hear it. We hear it amongst each other. And we know that life's uncertainties brings a sense of heaviness. And so how do we keep pressing on in times when we just don't know what to do? If you would, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Whether it's a physical Bible or the Bible app. And while you're turning there, I'm going to give you some context to chapter 1, right? So Paul and Timothy are writing to the Philippian church. They've got some really good friends there. They've got a strong bond. And uh, Paul's just like, hey, I know the Philippians. They're going in it right now. You see, in this time in history, the Philippians are ongoing persecution as a church. Emperor Nero is burning people alive, burning Christians alive to just try to shake the faith. They're living in extreme poverty. There's division in the church. They're at each other's throats. And Paul's like, Paul, mind you, mind you, is in under Roman house arrest. It's like his favorite place to be. He's in shackles. He's like, hey, Timothy, let's write another letter. But we've got to encourage them. We've got to tell them to keep going because there's some young Christians there who might give up the ship. They might give up, but they got to know. And I feel like it's a relevant book for us right now, right? If Paul was writing this letter, it, we, we find ourselves in similar times. God is sending back this letter reminding us and encouraging us. Things around us, pressures are mounting. They're multiplying at alarming rates, and there's no book to figure out what's next. None. So let's, let's start with verse 1. Let's get into this and figure out what Paul's trying to say here. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. It says, this letter is from Paul and Timothy. Slaves of Christ Jesus, I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and deacons. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Man, check out this tone in his letter. He's like, man, every time I think of you, man, I, I, I give thanks. Later on in the chapter, he's like, I sincerely love you. My heart longs for you. So the tone here is really, really good. They're on good terms. Not, when he wrote the Galatians letter, the first chapter, he's like, man, how quickly you, you forgot Jesus. How quickly you distorted the gospel. But that's not what we see here. Let's go on. Verse 4. He says, Whenever I pray, I make requests for all of you with joy. For you have been my... What is that word? Some translations might say participants. For you have been my partners. You have been participants in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. So what's he getting fired up about? He said, hey, you're not a group of spectators. You're a group of participants, right? That word participants is the Greek word koinonia, which means community. It means fellowship. It means a, an active contributor. So he's like, hey, thank you for actively contributing to the advancing of the gospel. And man, if, if I could say that to you, I feel like Paul is saying the same thing to us, right? Hey, thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank you for spreading the gospel, even though I know life is tough. Even though I know you've got all sorts of things on your mind and things on your plate. Thank you for stepping up to the plate. So a lot of you here are active participants. Participants, not just inside the church, but in our community. You're the hands and feet of Jesus. 
You're tired. I know it. I feel it. I'm tired too. But some of you are spectating. Christianity, Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's not for spectator sport because you're going to get tired. I'm telling you, if you're just spectating, if you're not included in the body, if you're not fulfilling your role, you will never live to life's full expectancy. So Paul is saying, hey, thank you for participating. Thank you that you are a group who knows what to do. So for those of you who are tired, who find yourself in this spot, you're just like, man, I'm just glad I showed up on a Sunday. Keep on going. Keep on going. Keep on breathing. Those around you are watching. The world is watching you. If I could tell you, I, I feel like God wants to say to you and I that the kind of church, the kind of people he's looking for are, are people that participate. Not just spectate. People that are part of something, but don't just attend something. So you might find yourself new to this church. You're like, man, what's this all about? I just found myself new here, and there's something different. I feel the presence of God here. You're fully equipped. All of you have a purpose to fulfill. You think that by accident, your specific talent and gift was appointed here at Journey Church for nothing? There's no way. So if that's you, if the Holy Spirit is proding you, because I believe that the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, everyone here has a specific role, young and old. If you're breathing, you still got life within you. And Jesus did not die for us to just spectate this sport. He's called all of you to action. So I would say, shameless plug, where's my growth track people? Are there any growth track people here? Yeah, okay. Some of y'all just faking me right now. It's all right. Hey. Get plugged in. Go to our next step station. We would love to talk to you about our mission, vision, and, and values here. And then help you with your spiritual growth. So you can get plugged in. So that you can link arms with me. Because I need you. The people on the front row need you. The people who have lost people need you. Be participants. So let's talk about New Year's resolutions. Has ever, anyone ever made a New Year's resolution? Yeah. Okay. I'm, it might not be the season for you New Year's resolutions. We already done that, right? We, we try to lose weight. We try to do this. We try to read. And, and look, you may have gone into the new year, and now it's September, mind you. It's September, y'all. So start thinking about the next one, right? Hey, you're like, I got my new shoes. I got my new tights, whatever you might be wearing. And you're like, I, I'm going to do this. I got my plan. Adrian's giving me a plan. I own a gym, shaving this plug. Um... <laughs> And you're like going, right? March hits, you're like, my knees hurt. Or maybe you said, hey, I'm reading this Bible plan with you, and I just, I'm 40 days behind, you know? And then as life starts to get a little bit uncomfortable, you start to get busier, that knock at the door, right? You start to take it in, and you're just like slowly falling away. And you were just another good intention away from actually following through. So the Christian life can be the same way. Don't let your faith, don't let your commitment just be another good intention. Be marked by follow through. Why? Because the world is watching you to see if you actually believe what you believe. Hey, there's Adrian. Man, that guy, he's always happy. That's a lie. But nothing seems, to, nothing seems to ever knock him off his game. Why? Because I believe what I believe, and I'm calling all of you. Don't be another good intention. Follow through because the world wants to know what you have. They want to know that it's tangible, that the hope that you actually talk about is real. So, how do we keep pressing on? Here's my first point. Be confident that God will finish the work that he started. Be confident that God will finish the work that he started. Don't rely on your own self to do everything. God is the one who begins it and finishes it. Amen? Let's look at verse 6. He says, And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So in other translations, he says confident, right? I'm confident. 
I'm confident that God will finish what he started. So if you're the Philippian church, you and I are the Philippian church right now, and we're reading this letter from Paul, we're like, dude, Paul, how in the world are you confident right now? I, I literally just lost my wife. She, she got burned, like, alive. I watched Nero burn her. I have no food. My kids are taken away. I'm in hiding. People don't like me. I'm trying to serve in the same church, and they don't like me. We're at odds. You yourself are in chains again. You're in chains, but yet you're confident. So you might find you're in that same boat, right? Like, hey, man, I don't know where, I, I don't know if there's going to ever be a mend in my marriage. I don't know if I'm ever going to find a job again. I don't know if I'm going to be homeless tomorrow or not. I don't know if I'll ever accomplish my dreams. Whatever your I don't know is, Paul's saying, I'm confident. I'm confident. If I could give you a tangible, a tangible, uh, relatable view of the Philippian church, I would, I would turn your attention to the Afghan Christian church. Has anyone been following that? So we know what's going on there. But I, I want to read to you what's actually going on from a Christian a journal, right? So it says Afghan Christians are estimated to number between ten and 12,000. Praise God. For decades they have largely practiced their faith underground because conversion is punishable by Sharia law. Dozens of Afghan Christians decided to include their religious affiliation on their national identity cards. So they put it on their IDs. I'm a Christian. Why? So that the future generations wouldn't have to hide their faith. But on this day, September 5th, memories of public executions, floggings, and amputations of Christians under the Taliban's previous rule remain vivid. The Taliban is reportedly already working to track down the known Christians on this list. So if you have that identity on your identity card, they're tracking you down. Other Christians are reportedly escaping to the hills in attempts to find safety. Some Christians on the ground have already expressed that with the takeover of Kabul, they are expected to be killed mafia style. This is happening. This is real life. It says, although some reports say that the Taliban has already conducted targeted killings of Christians, they're also executing anyone found with Bible software installed on their cell phones. Who's using the Bible app right now? You would be targeted. But Adrian, that's across the way. That doesn't affect me. Don't be so proud. Don't be so proud, American church, that that can't be us. And heaven forbid that it is us. But if you are in the same situation, I know that you are experiencing your own battles right now. But if you were put in the same situation, how would you respond? I always say responsibility. Responsibility is what? I, oh, well, a couple of my guys, I thought they were here, but they're not here. It's your ability to respond. That is your responsibility. How do you respond in times of persecution? You know, Pastor Adam, he was praying in staff meeting, man, Lord, would you raise Saul's and make them Paul's so that they could give hope. They could give hope to the Afghan people that they could say, hey, confidently, hey, I, I, I know. I know we're probably about to die here. I know that you've lost your entire family but it's okay because God, he started it. He's going to finish it. Would he raise up Paul's here in your circle? In your circle so you can say, hey, I, I know you've lost somebody. I know that you're going through a hard times. But let's remind each other. Let's remind each other that we're confident that God started this work. We're here appointed by him. And he's going to finish it. No matter what you're going through, no matter how hard it is, I am confident that God started it and he will finish it. So say that. God started it. He will finish it. God started it. He will finish it. How are you so confident, Paul? Well, well Paul starts in verse 3, right? Every time I think of you, he's remembering that. He's remembering the goodness of God. He's remembering how, how God even got him to the Philippian church. He's like, Timothy, 
Do you remember, man, about 10, 11 years ago when we even started that church? Dude, that was, that was wild. We were supposed to go to Asia. And the Holy Spirit blocked us. And we went to Europe instead. And then we found Lydia. She got saved. And then her whole family got saved. That was, that was a miracle in and of itself. We were at the right place at the right time. And then her, her house became the headquarters. And people started getting saved. Dude, you remember the last time I was in shackles again with Silas? I mean, we're, there we were. We were just worshiping, and then they just fell. He's like, dude, there's no way that was me. That was all God. I, and Paul might have been like, hey, yeah, I know I was part of the work. I was participating. I may have been the mouthpiece to spread the gospel, but at the end of the day, it was God's work. If I can be completely transparent now, even as a church leader, man, I, I put a lot of pressure on myself to not just exceed the expectations of, of those in leadership, but everyone here in this crowd, because guess what? I feel your burden. I feel your burden. I feel the burden knocking from 11.59 to 12.01, like the next day, all the time. And, and if, I, if I could be real, I could be like, I could do it all by myself. And then I could do all of this by myself, running a gym, being a husband, coaching, discipling, all of these things. No, God, I can do it all by myself. But he's like, why? It's my work anyways. He says, Adrian, I didn't put you in that spot for you just to thrash on your own. God didn't appoint you to this life so that you could just figure it out on your own. He said, hey, I started a good thing, and I'm going to finish it. And that's a promise. So relieve the pressure. Release the pressure from that life and just saying, hey, God, I, I can't do this right now. But I understand that you're going you're gonna to show the way. You're going to see me all the way through. Hey, listen, remember. Remember his goodness. Remember his goodness, because if you remember that God has worked in your past, you'll have confidence that he will work in your future. Be in a constant state of reflecting. Psalms 77, 11 through 12 says, But then I recall all you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts, and I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. He's reflecting. Jeremiah 17, 7 says, But blessed are those who trust in the Lord. Blessed, happy are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. These trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. They never stop producing fruit. Listen, you guys want to be a firmly planted tree? You want to produce fruit in every season? I hear that all the time. It's just not my season. It's just not my time. Man, a, a, a man or a woman who puts their hope and confidence in the Lord will always produce fruit in every season if you are firmly planted in him. So have moments of reflecting, God, you are so incredibly good. So what does that mean practically for you? It means change your language, y'all. Change your language. Shift your thoughts. You might have been part of that crowd that I don't think I could take another thing. If I see that person in my face one more time. I've heard that. If life throws one more thing at me, I, that's it, I'm giving up. Shift your language. Use the scripture. We have a God-breathed, inspired scripture. These are promises. This is part of your spiritual warfare. This is your weapon. Hey, how about 2 Corinthians 12, 9? God, my grace is all. Your grace is all I need. Your power works best in my weakness. I'm glad to boast about my weakness. Why? So that your power, Jesus, can work through me. Shift your language. Shift your thought. Remember. Remember that he started it. He's going to finish it. I tried not to run around today, but man, God's so good. Secondly, he says, desperately desire spiritual growth. Whew. 
desperately desire spiritual growth. Let's look at verse 9. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ Jesus' return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Christ Jesus. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. So Paul's not... Paul's not praying for their circumstances to necessarily change, which isn't a bad thing. You should absolutely pray for your circumstances because God will hear you. But more importantly, he, he's pointing something else out, something much deeper, something more tangible. He said, God, would you birth in them a love that is exceeding, that never ends, that, 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 that goes from one to the next that just overflows, not only for the common person, not only for those who love us, right? But even, even further, for those we don't associate with, but even more so for you, God. Birthing them a love that is growing for you. Why? Because in the next part of the verse, he says, so that they'll grow in knowledge and understanding. Listen, y'all, God puts circumstances in your life so that you might feel your way towards him, that you might know him more intimately. When you love him more and more and you find him in that secret place and you are communing on an intimate level, man, not only will your character, not only will your mind shift, but people get to experience the fruit of that. What does he say? He says, Paul says, May you be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Christ Jesus. What's the first fruit of the Spirit? What? It's love. How will they know that you love me? Well, you're going to treat them better. Why? Because you love me. You understand what is required of you in my word. Your, my word starts to molt on your character and people get to experience the fruit of your salvation. You will love them. You will bring joy. You will bring peace, peace into the room. Asia, that's not me. It is you. Because that's what the Bible says the fruit of your salvation is. But I don't feel it. That doesn't mean it's not right. Oh boy. So what's the point? Paul's saying, hey, I I want you guys to grow closer to him and that you as a church would not be marked by good intentions or talk, but through overflowing love for each other and Yahweh with an increased knowledge and revelation of him, you will be marked by action, consistency, and follow through. It means you got to get moving. It means you got to get moving. You got to keep putting that one foot in front of the other. I know because guess what? A watching world, they want to experience the fruit of your salvation. They want to know the intimacy that you have or don't have. That's why Paul says, more importantly, you should desire spiritual growth because some of you might not know that. Some of you might not know that intimacy. You don't know how to walk in front, but that's not, that's not anyone else's responsibility except for yours. Because Yahweh put the circumstances in your life, not my life. God is saying, the thing you need the most, y'all, is that you need to know, you got to know me, you got to love me, you got to live for me. That way, if life circumstances are good or if they're bad, you know that you know that you know that I got you and you got me. Can anyone relate to that? Can anyone reflect back to those moments where you're just like, man, God, I I remember back to 2016, y'all. (laughs) <laughs> this is kind of a, a, a vulnerable moment, but man, I was on the verge of losing my marriage, and none of y'all knew that. And God fully restored me. And so when I feel like times are hard, I know, God, you promised me you would restore me, and you totally did. Because it's not my work, it's your work. But all of you have some story you can reflect on, the goodness of God that you can reflect on. And, and more importantly, God wants your desire for spiritual growth to be at the top of your list. Because if you love him more, if you know him more, you know that for certain he's got you. My last point. 
In the Navy, we say one team, one fight. Can anyone relate to that? Yeah, I heard it. One team, one fight. That means we're fighting one adversary, y'all. Remember, I, I said at the beginning of this, you're either on a battleship or on a cruise ship. You're either a spectator or a participant. You're either fighting with us or against us. Because there's a lot of us here in the trenches who can even, who are watching, who have been participating, advancing the kingdom of God, and man, they're getting beat up. But we're on the same team. We're fighting the same battle. And the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. He's trying to say like, man, there's like 30 million over there, and they're all in your face over here. No, man. He's not everywhere at one time. We put that in front of our face. Instead of putting this in front of our face, instead of walking in our own authority, we are one team, one fight. Stand together and fight together. Let's go to verse 27. My Bible tour. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Oh. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news of Christ. Then whether I come to see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose. Fighting together, striving together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed. But that you are going to be saved even by God himself. So he's like, hey, your enemies are going to know that their time is coming if you guys would just stand together and fight together. Not against each other. In unity. Ooh. What? Within the same church, the Philippians were experiencing just, who's the, I'm, I serve Paul. I, I, it, it doesn't matter. We all serve one God. We're on the same team. We're on the same team. And I don't have a gifting that some people have. But I think in this social media society, we're like, well, this guy got three million likes, and this one got one, so that one's the one, right? Or maybe within your own circle, you're just like, I don't like what he said to me. I don't like that he held me accountable. I don't, I don't like that he used scripture, because that's his interpretation. And so we fight. Instead of fighting together. You know, you, there's that term. Uh, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. It, it, he says stand together. Stand together being a militant term, right? So for those of you in the military, man, we don't leave our post. Because someone is relying on us. If I leave my post and some enemy comes in, man, that's me. That falls on me. So standing firm, being relentless, unrelenting, unrelenting courage. Even if you're shot at, even if you're feeling adversity, you stand your post. For those of you who have been participating, stand your post. Because I can't stand it for you. Stand together. It says strive together. In Greek, in Greek, that word strive together is actually sunathleo. Which is incredible because athlete, athleo means to compete for a prize. The soon part is together. And it's one word. He's saying, compete for a prize together. Not individually. I think we always chop that soon part and say, no, nah, I'm competing. This is my ministry. These are my people. This is my opinion. And divisiveness just tears up the church. And he says, the enemy is going to know when you guys are united, when you are working together, when you are standing firm, when you are pressing on, that I am about to be destroyed. So I say to you, church, stand firm. Stand firm. Compete for a prize together. Why is that so important? Because all of you have a circle of influence that I can't touch. And it's not the pastor's job to necessarily meet all nine million of the people here, is it? Wow. Everyone has a specific role. Man, I, I can reflect back to like, there's been a lot of circumstances here at Journey Church where I've just seen the community just pour out. 
community pour out in support of other people who have either lost loved ones or maybe someone's car is broken down or, or maybe there's a need to cut someone's grass and they're filling it. Church, be the church. Believe what you believe. Why? So the enemy will know that we are getting united, that we are a united front because his time is coming. So, what, what's my takeaway, Adrian? Well, I'll keep it simple. You might find yourself in a position where you're just like, dude, you have no idea what you're talking about. You don't pay my bills. You don't see what I have to do this next week. You don't face the realities that I face. Okay? I don't need your help. I can do this by myself. No, you can't. Because your confidence in your own abilities wavers like this. Does it not? I know mine does. So instead of fixing your attention on your own abilities, remember that God started it. It's his ability. It's his work. He's the one who's going to finish it. Spend some time in reflection. Spend some time praising him. God started it. He will finish it. Secondly, Where's the prayer? Where's the request on your list for spiritual growth? Are your circumstances way up here and spiritual growth is way down here? Hey, flip that. I would say to you, if you experience intimacy like no other, you will understand. God wants you to understand that no matter what happens, if you love him and you are known by him, if you know him and you are living for him, that he's got you and you got him. Too many of us are just like, no, I got, I'm going to deal with this by myself. Desire spiritual growth. If you're not getting stronger, you're getting weaker, and that's a fact. I'm speaking to myself. You got you to grow, y'all. I can't do the growing for you. It's your responsibility. I'm just here to encourage you because guess what? If we were on a ship... If we were on a ship and we were manning the battle stations to the left and right of me, I got to know that you are not going to leave my side from left and right. Why? Because I want to go home to my wife and my kids. Because the person next to you might actually need Jesus. I'm not naive to think that, that everyone in this room is saved and they're watching us respond. So where is your desire for spiritual growth? Three, one team, one fight. Stand together and fight together. I said it in first service, and it's relevant now. Christianity is not a lone wolf sport. You will get beat up left and right and left out to dry. There's no way you can do this. There's no way you can fight this battle around your own. Get in community. Listen, we have small groups coming up next year. Man, if I did not get plugged into small groups back in 2018, I would not be standing right here. I would not be standing right here. There has been difficulties in our life where people just come around us as a community. One team, one fight. We got to stand together. All of you have a specific role in your life. And I get it, your responsibilities might be a little exceed mine or vice versa. But guess what? I'm here for you and you're here for me. So that the enemy will know that his day of reckoning is coming. And he's about to be destroyed. Stand firm. Stand up. Stand up. Dust yourself off. It's okay. If you need to cry, I'm here for you. There are people here for you. But don't give up. Don't give up the ship. Why? Because we're on the winning side. We're on the winning side. So if you guys would stand with me. This is time in our service where I feel like God is asking you to respond, right? We talked about good intentions and follow through. Maybe you find yourself here in this moment and you have no idea what this hope I'm speaking of is. You are so filled with, there's no peace in your mind. No peace in your heart, but you know that something is drawing you. That's the Holy Spirit. If you've never committed your life to Christ and, and no one looking around at this moment, 
if you've never committed your life to Christ, now will be your opportunity. Don't say I'll do it tomorrow because like I said, it'll just be another good intention. I know people. God's appointed every single person here to be a part of his family with a specific role. And so if I could use an analogy, if we were all here and I needed a line of 30 people just to fill this, if you never answered the call, there's a gap. Be participants. Give your life to Jesus. I'm going to be intentional. I'm not going to be around the bush. You need to give your life to Jesus. You need to have him as your Lord and Savior. So if that's you, look, I'm not promising a life of easiness because Paul actually said in verse 29, it's a privilege of trusting him, but a privilege of suffering for him. Why is it such a privilege to suffer for Christ? Well, because of Philippians. The Philippians didn't come to know Christ through Paul's easy ministry. No, they watched him suffer. They watched him suffer. You got to think about who's the recipient of your suffering. If you persevere, if you give your life to Jesus, who's going to come to know Jesus next? So if that's you, if you find yourself in need of Jesus, a Savior, hope, real hope, real tangible hope, as an act of intention, would you raise your hand? Because I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. If you find yourself in that position where you're tired, maybe you're just coming back to church for the first time, or you're just like, man, I need that reset. God, I, I want to recommit my life to you and say that I'm in all the way. I don't want to be just another good intention that fizzles out. Maybe that's you. I would like to pray for you. Would you raise your hand? Thank God. Thank God. Yeah. Lastly, you, you might be you might be the other person. You might be like, life is so hard right now. I understand what you're saying, Adrian, but I just, I don't know. I need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. I need strength. If that's you, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand? Yeah. Yeah. So if my ministry team could come up, I want you guys to do this. If if you were in any part of that, take a step of intentionalism. Don't be another good intention. God is calling you to fill a role. And he also wants to replace that burden of heaviness with joy. And we want to minister to you. We want to be real people who, who love Jesus and are showing him. So I would ask you as an act, step out. Do something different. Do something different. You do the same thing over and over, you get the same response. But this is your opportunity to do something different. Father, thank you for this moment in time. We're reminded to just keep going, to keep pressing on. Lord, thank you for this moment where we could just worship you and give our full attention to you. Lord, I'm asking that your church, your people, they would follow through. That you would pick them up, surround them with community. Understand that we're in this fight together. Lord, that they would, that you would birth in them a new love for you and for other people that exceeds expectations, Lord. We all have limited capacities, love, but you can exceed that capacity. So, Lord, birth in them new love, a new life, God. Lord, would they desperately desire not just circumstances changing, but true 
and spiritual growth. And God, would you give them moments of reflection, Father, of all the good that you have done. Lord, would you give them hope. And Lord, would you rise up people here at Journey Church to stand in the gap, to fill that role, to link arms with each other in community. Lord, give hope where there seems to be no hope. Bring joy, true joy that lasts, not just topical happiness, but Father, true joy. Give peace where peace is needed, Lord, and clarity of mind to all those who are struggling. Lord, would you just take these people and use them for your glory. And we just thank you for this time in your presence, my King. Thank you for such a privilege. Lord, would you rise up Paul's? Would you rise up an army of Christians who follow through all the way? Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So there's still time. There's still time. You can sit here. You can you can pray. Come minister or uh, get prayer. Hey, hey if that if I have spoken anything to you specifically, um, and you want to take that next step, I would love to talk to you. So would our next steps, people. But if you are. If you will find yourself like, man, this was it, it was good, I just say, hey, enjoy your weekend. But tell someone on, that you don't know what your name is. Be intentional. Be the church. Get to know people. Have a happy Sunday. <laughs>